Great, John, thank you very much and good evening, everyone. Every day in America, nearly seven out of 10 people get up in the morning, quit their job and then go to work. These are the employees who are disengaged. Now they may show up for work, but they're not cognitive, cognitively or emotionally connected to their work. They do the minimum required and have no loyalty. And if you consider for a second the danger to a company's health, if upward to 70% of employees may leave for a slightly better offer, that's a dangerous situation to be in for a lot of organizations. Also disturbing is the fact that only one in five employees are considered very engaged and, and plan to stay for a long time. So it, it, it begs the question, well, why is there such a level of uh, disengagement in organizations? And it's been historically around that, that level of uh, 70, 65 to 70 percent of employees are not engaged in a typical organization. Well, today we're going to talk a little bit about why employees leave rather than stay. And as a jumping off point to that, I'm going to discuss some uh, actionable high payoff activities or strategies that you can use to attract and retain employees. I'll also talk about something called the circle of success, which you can use to put into context how to apply these strategies and what it does to convert high, empl high uh, uh, employee engagement to results. And then I'm going to turn it over to Lori, and Lori's going to talk about um, some equally important issues and legal technical aspects of running a business as it relates to employee employee benefits uh, and uh, contracts. So with that, let's talk a little bit to start about why employees leave. There's a lot of reasons why employees are disengaged and do leave. Uh, some of those issues relate to things having nothing to do with the workplace. They could be issues at home. Uh, domestic issues, financial issues, illness. Um, I'm not going to discuss those today. We're going to sort of confine our our uh, level of disengagement factors to the ones you see in the screen here. These are all avoidable, but you have to proactively work to prevent or eliminate them. A couple I wanted to comment on here before moving on to those five strategies. Employees who join great companies will leave poor managers. And that's a direct quote from Gallup's annual survey of employee engagement across the country. They've been tracking employee engagement in, in the U.S. workforce for the better part of probably 15 to 20 years. And as I said earlier, the engagement level is around 20, 28 to 33 percent. So around, by contrast, then 70 percent of employees are seven out of 10 are considered disengaged. And poor managers is a, has a huge impact on employee engagement and as, re, and as a result, results of the organization. In fact, the level of uh, a manager's ability to keep their employees engaged is the greatest explainer or explains the greatest variation in difference in employment engagement scores from one organization to the next. Also important are all some of the, some of the other things you see in the screen here, lack of clear company vision. And you'll see, a, you'll see several things here that have to do with the employee or employee's feelings about the organization and their involvement in it. Many times um, engagement or lack of it is, is determined by the fact that people just aren't feeling inspired by what they do. They feel that their strengths are not being utilized properly. They don't feel valued. There's a low sense of belonging. There's a poor balance between work life and, 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 and uh, uh, off the job uh, balance. Um, they don't understand or know how their manager views their performance. So these are things that um, all cause that statistic you see in the upper right that basically says that research over the last few years has shown that 63% of U.S. workers say they are open to a, a job switch, which closely matches that 70% disengagement number I mentioned a moment ago. Now, in the limited time we have together here, I'm going to focus on five high payoff actions that any business can and should do to address these challenges. So let's move right into those. Number one, it's very important to connect people to the whys of the business. And the whys are the things that tell us what's important and where to focus time and energy in an organization. And collectively, core values, mission, and vision are those are those are the basis for those whys. And they also form uh, and, and direct the guiding path and the driving path for a business that leads to results. As you can see from this chart, the guiding path has to do with the strategy of the business, the goals that are set, objectives and individual activities that lead to results. And then on the culture side, values, mission, and vision inform and, and, and help drive culture, 
values, practices, and behaviors. Both of those paths ultimately lead to results. So anything, especially starting with values, mission, and vision um, that are unknown or are, people are unclear about are gonna affect the, the those paths and ultimately results. And as the statistic from Human Capital League uh, shows here, not everybody may know what their own organization's values, missions, and visions are. And if we accept the fact that the whys are important to, to let people know what is important and where to focus time and energy, it's impossible for people to deliver on those whys if they don't know or understand them. So my first tip of the day would be, if this would be a very good time for owners and leaders of organizations to reintroduce to employees the core values and mission and vision of the organization. And equally important, is not to let messages or dialogue or conversation about these things get lost competing for attention with everything else. Values, mission, and vision deserve dedicated attention and conversation. I see many organizations that um, will have their mission and their vision statement and maybe their core values listed on their website and maybe in a break room for employees to see. That's not enough. It needs to be something that gets as much conversation as anything else. Number two, Based on behavioral science, how we perform is heavily influenced by answers to five questions that are always in the minds of everybody in a workplace, especially those that might be working remotely. And without the right answers to these good questions, employers are going to fill in their own, which quite often will lead to results that may not be what everybody wants. So let me go through these five questions and talk a little bit about them. Number one, employees are asking, what should I do? It's important to be sure that employees understand what they're being asked to do. Um, conference board research, which lines up with the human capital league thing, uh, research I, I mentioned a moment ago, conference board did some research recently and found again for a typical organization, nearly 60, nearly 66% or two thirds of the employees are only one third as productive as they could be because they simply don't understand what they're being asked to do. So it's very important to make sure to overcome that deficit in terms of understanding that people have clear and unambiguous expectations and to know exactly what they're, what they're being asked to do. And that means also that it needs to go beyond a merely a written job description. The second question is, how should I do it? This has obvious implications for your uh, skills and knowledge development of your employees. Uh, and what I would recommend here is that is to think about what you do to develop your employees from a skills and knowledge standpoint that it's not enough to put information in people's brains and ask them to retain it to call your training or your, your people development efforts a success. What matters is that the people have the confidence to use those skill sets and that knowledge that you have trained them on or that they bring to the job. So it's important to make sure that you, you complete the circle of training and, and skills development by making sure that they will confidently use what they are trained on or what they're supposed to be doing. The next question is what I call the performance question. How am I doing at it? This question has everything to do with making sure that people are receiving feedback as often as possible so they know where they stand. One of the worst things that can happen is for someone to not know exactly how they're doing. If you remember one of the things I said that causes people to be disengaged and to leave is that they don't know what their manager thinks of their performance. You overcome that by making sure that you're, you're always be cognizant of answering this question. And I talk about making sure that you close what I call the feedback gap, which is that period of time between the, a point when you're giving people or individuals feedback on how they're doing. You want to close that gap down and make it as in real time as possible. And implicit in that is that an annual, an annual review with an employee only is not a good move because that by definition means that for the rest of the year, people are wondering, how am I doing? So an annual review is okay but it should be part of a larger effort to make sure you're closing that feedback gap. The next question is what I call the motivation question. <clears throat> Why should I do it? We could also restate this question as what's in it for me. And here it's important to make sure that in answering this question, we're helping people to connect the personal meaning to the performance that they're doing on the job and the goals that they're being asked to contribute to. And the best set of tools to use to make that connection are to use uh, good recognition and incentive best practices. This is also a, a big missing area for a lot of organizations who underestimate and undervalue the importance of using, <clears throat> excuse me, recognition, recognition and incentives to drive an answer to this question. The last question 
it obviously has a lot to do with whether people stay or leave like the rest of these, but this one is particularly important. Where am I going? Or alternatively put, what's my future here? It's important to be transparent about opportunities and talk about ways that employees can enhance their skills and their value so that they understand and know what their path is. If people in an organization are unsure what their future looks like in this or in a particular organization, they're going to be more open to a temptation to leave. So these are five questions that um, you need to always make sure that you're answering because employees are always looking for answers to these. And just as uh, nature abhors a vacuum in physics, um, a, uh, a vacuum of the right answers for these questions in an organization can lead to the same results. One other tip that I would, not tip, but the thing I would uh, stress is that an additional benefit of making sure that these questions are answered properly is that equally informed people will seldom disagree. Now, number three in the strategy uh, retention strategy area is to increase dialogue with employees and customers using what I call the 13X rule. The more employees and customers talk, the more you're going to learn. If your current cadence is quarterly with employees um, by way of a newsletter or a town hall meeting or a, 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 a periodic meeting that's quarterly with, with customers, doing it 13X means taking it up to a weekly cadence. Plus, it's important if you're a leader or a manager to have the courage to ask, tell us what we ask what we're doing wrong. Tell us what we're doing wrong. Good leaders have the courage to ask this question and more importantly, will listen and they'll they'll respond to the, the, the answers and they'll do something about it, even the, if the answer is an uncomfortable one for the leader. So it's important to um, always be willing to ask that question, have the courage to do it. One last tip in this area that I would recommend is that when whenever you're in conversation with fellow employees or as a manager or a leader, force yourself to listen one more minute to the people you're talking with. And when I say listen, I mean listen. Don't talk for one minute, one more minute. Force yourself to listen for one more minute. It does a couple of things. Number one, you're more likely to pick up at one more bit of information or intelligence that can help you to make a better informed decision because you learned something that you didn't know. Secondly, and maybe more importantly, that extra minute spent with people is going to further demonstrate that you value them and what they have to think, what they have to think or contribute. Number four, you know, it's more challenging than ever to stay focused on what's important, especially where working remotely adds distractions. And in my 40 plus years of helping businesses with workplace performance, I've observed two truths of human behavior that I think apply um, in the workplace. Number one, what gets talked about in this world is what gets done. And number two, what gets measured in this world is what gets done. So turn these truths, two truths into your ally. Talk and talk about and measure things that are important. And a specific tip here to reduce distractions and confusion about what you're measuring, try to concentrate on offering a fewer level of metrics that you're tracking performance, either on an individual basis or across the organization or across a team of people. A quote from the Workplace Accountability Study to this point says, quote, organizations with a few memorable, meaningful key results will reduce employee confusion to nearly zero. And their research has found that that number should be three to five metrics max. You know, another way to think about these two truths is I think they also apply to the greater community and society and how we contribute uh, within, our, within our own place in society. Imagine uh, if we had more discussion about financial literacy and how that could help grade school and high school kids better understand, think, better understand things like under, uh, financial risk and the time value of money and personal responsibility. So these could be applied in, in your personal life as well. Number five, time for new mindsets or to take these, these mindsets uh, to another level. Encourage employees to see themselves as problem solvers primarily as opposed to be, merely uh, performing tasks. The benefits of turning people into problem solvers as opposed to just going through a series of tasks is that problem solving breaks down big problems into manageable chunks. It reduces a sense of overwhelm for people because they have a, a, a greater sense of where to start to attack a problem. It energizes their accountability and it makes it easier for people to take action because we can break things down into smaller chunks. As important, it's important for, for, for um, managers and leaders to coach more and manage less. Great leaders do a good job of coaching. 
mediocre managers and leaders merely direct traffic. Those great leaders recognize that their primary responsibility is to help people to be their best, to make sure that expectations are clear to everyone, that they themselves are visible and available to their employees like never before, that they eliminate distractions that are keeping themselves from their people, and they give frequent in the, in the moment feedback whenever wherever possible. So talk about re reducing that, that feedback gap I talked about. And last, but probably, and not least important is to emphasize positives over punishment wherever possible. So let me conclude my remarks very quickly with something I call the circle of success. And I offer this as a way for you to put into context and to visualize the cause and effect relationship between engaged employees, loyal customers, growth and retention. And that cause and effect pretty much goes like this. Highly engaged employees consistently deliver more surprise and delight customer experiences, and those surprise and delight experiences will turn customers into loyal customers who will buy more, buy more often, refer others, and will stay. Those loyal customers and more of them will fuel more growth and financial stability, and that growth and financial stability reinforces the employee connection to the company and the whys. And then in turn, at the end of the at, at, at the at the top of this circle, the connected employees then tend to stay and will continue this circle of success. If you're interested in this concept, there's some a related reading that I would recommend for you. There's an article called The Service Profit Chain from the Harvard Business Review. It's a little bit scholarly, but is uh, does a much deeper dive into the, the underlying concept of this. So those of you who want to dig deeper, that would be a place you can go. But note how this circle is driven by employees who are highly engaged. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a critical important point here. Now, in our next session next Tuesday, we're going to explore how the right culture contributes not only to the circle of success, but also contributes to high employee engagement and vice versa. So with that, um, before going to Lori, I'm going to ask, uh, are there any questions, uh, John? Um, no, we're um, we're good now, Mark. Thanks a lot. Uh, okay, very great. insightful information. Uh, question I have: the reference you had to the um, Harvard Business Review. Yes. Uh, could you put that in the chat when uh, uh, when you after you turn over to Lori? Yeah, I tell you what I'll do. I don't have it in front of me. I will get it to you, and I'll ask you to to, to, to we can disseminate okay. at a later point if that's okay. That's great. Thanks yeah. a lot. But I think if you do a search on Harvard Business Review and, and search the service profit chain, it should show up. But I'll, I'll get you a specific, a specific link or the information. Okay, thanks. Great. Okay, good. Uh, Laura, I'm going to turn it over to you. And thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mark. Um, and thank you to Mark and John and to SCORE um, and to everybody for, for your attendance. Uh, I appreciate this opportunity to come back and present to SCORE. I'm actually a past SCORE um, client. Uh, when I started my own practice in 2011, I learned about SCORE and used a mentor and it's an excellent resource, I have to say. So as you can see, the challenge of attracting and retaining employees has many components. Uh, Mark shared that culture and people focus are key. And I agree with a lot of your concepts, even from an employment law and common sense uh, perspective, it's good to have open communications. It's important to have regular feedback and not to wait until you know the annual performance review, not only because if you do have regular feedback and give people opportunities to improve, it might actually work. And then things will, you know, things will develop and you won't have to worry about a bad review or letting somebody go. On the other hand, if things aren't going well and you do have to let somebody go, you've let them know that, you know, you've given them the chances, you've given them the counseling, you've documented it. And from a lawyer's perspective, that's important because if that person comes back and says, no, this is because I was over 50, you can say, no, here are the reasons we gave you the chances and you couldn't do it. So it's good from a risk uh, avoidance perspective. Obviously, from a legal perspective, compliance with the legal requirements is crucial, uh, just as is demonstrating a fair, open work culture from the top down and really showing that. Um, companies also have choices regarding many employment 
terms, policies, and conditions. And those decisions and choices can impact whether your company is a place that people want to join and stay. And so one of those choices is whether an employee will be employed on an at-will basis or instead given some extra job protection. So I commonly hear from people, you know, is Illinois an at-will state? We don't really have at-will states. At-will basically means um, that either party can end a relationship at any time without cause or notice. And essentially, unless there's a written contract that says otherwise, that says this is a three-year term or we can only fire you for these reasons and gives you that extra job protection, then it's an at-will uh, employment uh, relationship. And most relationships are at will. You don't have to have any fancy contract. An offer letter that's signed by both the company and the individual becomes the employment agreement. Um, some companies have fancier, longer employment agreements, but they can still be at will and provide for compensation, benefits, and other terms. Uh, termination by a company for cause uh, is something that is would give extra protection to somebody. So um, rather than at will or for any reason, um, it could only be for certain reasons that would be listed. Um, and if it's without cause, then typically an employee will get severance pay or will get something more than their just their salary and unused vacation. Know that without cause does not mean any reason in the world. It can't be an illegal reason. So you can't fire somebody because of their race or because they complained about unsafe conditions. So it's limited in terms of any reason. It also important to know that an employee handbook that has certain language says, such as a progressive discipline policy uh, or a termination for cause or probation. Those kinds of things can be considered uh, contract terms and can convert an employee handbook, which should just be general guidelines into a contract that employees can then enforce and try and hold you to certain provisions. So you don't want something like that. Um, Let's see, uh, along with termination for cause, sometimes for a top executive or a key employee, there will be a, a provision that the employee can terminate for good reason, such as a material change in their, uh, their duties or their compensation or relocation you know, beyond 50 miles, something like that. So many C-level or top executives are given that provision as well. Uh, and I think uh, we're ready for the next slide, Mark. So undoubtedly compensation and benefits are high on the list for attracting and retaining employees. Some employers may have ranges of compensation. Some may have a set salary. Sometimes a candidate may be rejected because he or she is considered overqualified or at such a high level of pay based on their recent comparable salary. Um, uh, we now have a, a rule in Illinois and in many states um, called a salary history ban. And this, this prohibits both the employer and the recruiter from asking a candidate what their salary is, what their salary history has been, what level they're at. The reason for this is we're trying to avoid perpetuating discrimination against minorities and women for the most part. If you're basing salary on what they've already been getting on their basically illegal salary history, it doesn't help <laughs> to, to avoid that perpetuation. So by not asking them, by not requiring them to give you that information or using that information, hopefully that will uh, resolve that issue. An employee or a candidate can voluntarily tell you what their salary is, or even what you can ask them what range they're seeking. But even if they voluntarily tell you their salary or their history, you're not supposed to use that in making your decision. So there's also some new laws that require employers um, to provide salary details in job postings and recruiting. Um, we don't have that yet in Illinois, but New York has that, uh, California now has that, and 
again, this is salary transparency so that people don't have to beat around the bush and ask questions and wonder what am I going to get paid. Um, it's, it's, it's out there and it's also for existing employees so that they know what the ranges are and whether they're, they're within the range. As far as compensation and benefit packages, uh, be creative and think out of the box to attract and retain employees. Consider giving a salary increase or even promising a, the consideration of a salary increase after six months rather than waiting a year. Um, a signing bonus or a retention bonus if somebody stays for a year or a certain amount of time. Um, incentive packages, as we know, can include stock options, commission, long-term and short-term incentive, management bonuses, benefits also the typical health insurance, dental vision, disability, long-term, just long-term, things like that. Um, but with the labor shortage and the difficulty of keeping and really attracting employees and not losing them to competitors, benefits are a very hot topic right now. And HR and benefit professionals are looking at work-life balance, flexible arrangements, hybrid schedules, work from home. Uh, one of the big ones is adding or enhancing parental leave, paid parental leave for all parents to bond with a new child, as opposed to just providing maternity leave to a mother for her disability period. Um, paid time off, vacation, sick leave, there are some laws that we will see on the next slide that, that are required. Um, and you know, most employers understand that we all have lives. There are emergencies, family issues, house issues, and we want to be flexible with our employees and recognize that they have lives. So you can encourage uh, a flexible schedule or perhaps certain times off like a family reunion every March and show that you're really uh, supporting the employee both at work and in their personal life. You can also extend paid days or paid leave uh, with unpaid leave um, to make it easier for an employee. Next slide, Mark. So Chicago and some Cook County businesses already are have mandated paid sick leave. And that's been the law since 2017. Um, that's the Cook County and Chicago paid sick pay, earned sick leave ordinances, which apply to employers that are either in Chicago or Cook County, other than the 50 plus towns that opted out of the Cook County Paid Sick Leave Act. Um, if you happen to be you know, one of those companies that either opted out or is not in Chicago or Cook County, next year, starting January 1st, you will be subject to the Illinois Paid Leave for All Workers Act, which was just signed by Governor Pritzker, I think a week ago. This makes Il Illinois the third state mandating paid time off to employees for any reason. It's not just sick leave. It's not justification, it's any reason. Um, each employee will accrue one hour for every 40 hours worked up to 40 hours a year, which is similar to the paid sick leave ordinance. They'll, they'll be eligible to use it after 90 days of employment. And at the end of the year, they get to carry over all unused leave, which is much different than the current paid sick leave laws. There's also notice requirements that you will have to put into your policies um, in terms of when they have to notify the company of a foreseeable leave, or if it's not foreseeable, as soon as practicable. A company does not have to pay out unused leave at separation, which is different from the vacation rule in Illinois. Um, so it's important that um, you have a paid leave policy or that you check your policies and make sure that they're consistent with uh, or will be consistent by January 1st. As far as the um, carryover, there is one exception. If an employer front loads all 40 hours of paid leave on the first day of employment or the first day of the year, then you do not have to give them any unused hours at the end of the year. So you may not want them to get it all at once, but if you do and they don't use it, they don't get to carry it over. Uh, and on a related note, I would just um, 
give you a reminder that the Illinois Human Rights Act um, disability discrimination and harassment law has been expanded so that employees and contractors and applicants who have an association with a person with a disability, even if that person, the employee is not disabled themselves, uh, cannot be discriminated against. So this aims to protect people because they're caring for an ill family member. Um, I had a recent case where an individual was fired because they have a child with severe disabilities and the company was concerned by the increasing insurance costs. That's a no-no. You don't fire somebody on that basis. Also under the Illinois Secure Choice Act, employers right now with 25 or more employees um, have to have a retirement plan. And starting on November 1st, if you have five or more employees, you will have to get a retirement plan. Um, other perks um, would be um, relocation, uh, relocation expense reimbursement, which is pretty common for top positions for people that are moving you know, across states or internationally. Travel client entertainment expense reimbursement, um, know that Illinois has a mandatory expense reimbursement law. So for necessary business expenses, you can have a policy, um, but you have to uh, abide by the policy. And if an employee abides by it, you have to pay those expenses. So you cannot refuse. Uh, okay, any questions at this point? Well, I think there might be one. see the beginning um, of yeah the there's question. one question but um yeah it looks like the beginning of a question i actually have a, a, a question here on the carryover of all unused um uh, paid sick leave or paid leave yes uh, is you said it would carry over but i'm assuming that that would still max out at 40 hours per year you can't go over the 40 hours is that correct right uh, I, I believe that's true. That's a good question. I don't don't know if that's uh, has been sorted out yet, but that's typically what it is. Is that you know you carry over and it doesn't accumulate, so that you know you're up to 500 hours at some point. I think there's probably a limit to carry over what's unused from that year, from what you earned that year. That's what I would guess. Okay. But we'll wait and, to see. And the other question here is, um, when is the retirement benefit required? And I believe that that's probably for the 20, well, 25 and for the five. Are there different time right. periods as, for that? As of now, as of last November 1st, uh, employers with 25 or more employees have to have a retirement plan. And as of November 1st of this year, it goes down to employers with five or more employees. So even small employers will have to do that by November 1st. And uh, the final question on the same topic here, does, do the, these laws pertain to contract workers? Uh, no, they do not. They only apply to employees. So, okay. so far, at least we have that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you, all good Thanks. questions. Next slide, Mark. So as, Part of new employment or even continued employment, we have restrictive covenants, which are, could be necessary to protect companies' goodwill, their confidential information and trade secrets, their long-term clients. But these kind of restrictions have to be used and drafted carefully. They need to be reasonable and not overbroad, which not only may be illegal or unenforceable, but could scare away potential employees. Um, or even current employees, if you're forcing them to sign a, a, a new agreement that isn't, uh, isn't kosher. The best time to establish these restrictions would be at the higher stage. So some employers will uh, require a new employee to, to sign an, an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement that they won't use or disclose the company's confidential information. Um, other companies may want additional requirements, such as they, uh, somebody will not compete for a certain period after they leave, or they won't solicit away certain clients or employees. Um, and again, these you can have restrictions that apply, of course, during employment, but a lot of employers feel that it's important to have them for at least an, a, a portion of time after. 
as I said, not all employees have employment agreements. Um, sometimes though, an offer letter, which becomes an employment agreement can include an NDA provision or even a non-compete or non-solicit. If you don't get these restrictions at the front end, then you may need to get them at the back end when an employee is leaving. So as part of a severance agreement, obviously you have less leverage then than you do at hire. So again, try to consider these at the beginning. Some employers have confidentiality policies. I've even seen employee handbooks with non-compete provisions. Those are not worth the paper they're written on. A non-compete has to be in a signed contract. It's not in a handbook. Um, unless your handbook is a contract um, based on the caveats I gave you earlier. Often when a company is, is purchased, whether or not the buyer retains the owner um, for some time during for transition, there will be non-compete on the owner and key employees. And sometimes when a key executive is given um, an incentive or stock option agreement, often the terms of that agreement or the, the stock option plan that it's based on include these restrictions. Uh, so non-competes and non-solicits aren't the only restrictive covenants, but they're the important ones. Non-compete is the strictest, which means you can't work for a competitive company or in a competitive business for a certain duration. The non-solicit prevents soliciting away customers or employees. And sometimes there's what I call a non-solicit plus. Not only can you not solicit customers, but you can't accept their business and perform the work even if you didn't solicit it. To me, that's a non-compete. So it's important that these be reasonable and narrow. Uh, we talk about geographic, temporal, and activity scope. It should be a limited geographic scope. I mean, in the old days, a five or 10 mile radius was pretty standard. Now that we have a global economy, there are for enforceable valid restrictions that can cover the whole world, because if a company's market is the world, you can keep somebody from working in that market for that time. In other areas, you know, it has to be more limited. Duration is also important. Uh, a typical post-employment non-compete or non-solicit is one to two, one to two years. Um, anything longer than two or three years is really unacceptable and most of the time I'm seeing one year these days, sometimes maybe a little longer for a non-solicit. A court will uphold a, a longer non-compete for example, for highly trained employees that have specific knowledge that could be damaging in the hands of a competitor. And the courts have to weigh the legitimate business interest of the employer, which are um, the employee's exposures to customer relationships and the long-term relationships that you have and the goodwill and the employee's use of confidential information and access to that, those are legitimate business interests to protect. Those have to be weighed against um, an individual's um, right to, you know, to work. Um, and it can't be so overbroad or in, uh, it, um, cause undue hardship to an employee so that they absolutely can't work. They're also restricted from um, uh, restrictions that violate public policy, uh, such as an agreement that gives an employer a virtual monopoly on the workforce in a field or unduly deprives somebody from going to work you know, at all. <laughs> so they have to be legitimate. They usually have to be tied to the employee in terms of the confidential information access. Um, customers that they had a relationship with or involvement with or had some information about not just all customers of the company from the first day the company opened. And sometimes you also um, have to uh, require that uh, they be related to the same position. So first of all, if a, if a, a you can't stop a, a an employee from going to um, a company that's not a competitor and you can't stop them from doing business or doing activities that are not competitive. Um, but if they are competitive, you know, then, then there's an issue. The other big key 
under non-competes is what we call legal consideration, which means something of value that you give to the employee or the candidate for signing this agreement and agreeing to these post-employment restrictions. For non-competes and non-solicits, states require, many states, including Illinois, require more than simply uh, new employment or you know, sign this in order to keep your job. It requires more than uh, uh, at-will employment. So next slide. Uh, under the Illinois Freedom to Work Act, which uh, was, was enacted last January, 2022, the rules on non-competes have become stricter in Illinois. I'm sure many of you have heard about this. It's only applicable to contracts that were signed on and after January 1st of 2022. The law only applies to employees, not to contractors. And it essentially codifies, makes into law, a lot of the laws that the uh, courts have already uh, basically enacted through case law, which is called common law. So a lot of this isn't new, but it's now in written statute. And that includes the two year rule, um, which means that in order for an employer to be able to enforce a post-employment non-compete or non-solicit, unless you give somebody consideration when they sign the agreement, which we'll talk about in a minute, then you can't enforce those provisions in, unless and until the employee continues to remain employed for two years after signing. A two-year at-will employment, the courts and now the, the, the legislature uh, have decided that's enough that the employee has gained to be able to enforce these. But if you didn't get them to, if you didn't give them any consideration, you didn't give them what the statute requires, additional professional or financial benefits with or without a period of employment, which is very legalese and, and very hard to understand. Essentially, a signing bonus or stock options or um, agreeing to a certain period of employment you know, before they would be terminated. Um, and if they're terminated without cause during that period, they may get severance. Those are that's consideration that is more protective than at-will employment. So that's now required. Um, unfortunately, you know, we don't yet know what those quotes mean. It'll take case law and uh, you know, some, some disputes before we know what that means. But we do know that signing bonus is typically 10% of salary or the agreement to pay severance, typically three months of severance if you fire somebody without cause, that has been good consideration to the courts. Now the new statute also requires that to enforce a non-compete and an, an employee has to be uh, earning at least $75,000 a year, which will increase over the next 15 years to 90,000. To enforce the non-solicit, you have to be making 45,000 a year and that will also increase. And also um, a big discouragement to employers is that if an employer sues to enforce these post-employment non-compete or non-solicit and loses, the company pays the employee's attorney's fees. That's a very big disincentive. So um, let's get to the next, my final slide, um, which is a lot of talk these days about the Federal Trade Commission's recently proposed non-compete ban. Um, that proposed rule that came January 5th, we know that the FT, FTC is empowered to make rules and regulations to prevent unfair competition. The FTC has found that non-competes are an unfair method of competition, which they, they are um, in a lot of situations with low paid workers, with people who you know, really don't have confidential information or access to uh, uh, to customers and things like that. According to the FTC, one in five American workers are impacted by non-competes with 30 million US workers, and it includes skilled and even non-skilled workers. And so that they go too far. So this rule, which is a proposed rule and it's still in process, it's still in the comment stage, would ban non-competes. Um, 
would ban all employer non-competes between an employer and an employee. So that's gonna be a big change if that really happens. Um, for now, we know that non-competes mostly remain enforceable if they are within those restrictions that I discussed. We have to look to state law for nuances because state law is what dictates whether, an, uh, whether these restrictive agreements are enforceable or not. Every state has different laws. Our, our, ours requires certain consideration. A lot of other states don't require anything beyond at-will employment. Um, and non-solicits and confidentiality, non-disclosure agreements are not affected by this. But we will, we do anticipate a strong push by the business community to narrow this scope of this rule so that it again maybe only applies to low-wage workers, that there's precautions like advance notice before signing and limiting the length of the restrictions. Um, and there will probably be litigation if that rule is uh, actually becomes law. So next, next uh, slide, Mark. Um, we want to give you some key takeaways from tonight's se session, which are from Mark's presentation, connecting the whys, talking about your values, missions, and vision. And you can't talk about it enough. Make sure you practice the 13X rule of communications between with you and your employees, with employees and customers, and really listen. Answer the five questions that the employees are asking. Answer those and make sure that they're, they're, they know what is going on at the company and they feel invested. Of course, get up to speed on benefits, not only the ones that are required by law, but think about being creative and offering more than what's required, offering more than what the, the guy next door might be offering. Make sure you're reviewing contracts, em employee handbooks, um, policies, to make sure they, again, are compliant, but also flexible and recognize the work-life balance. And then we can talk about non-competes all day, but important to think about what consideration you might want to give for a non-compete before you even discuss compensation with the candidate. For example, rather than telling the candidate, we're gonna give you a $100,000 salary and a $10,000 signing bonus for this non-compete, Give them a $90,000 salary and a $10,000 bonus, and you still get up to your $100,000 without having to give extra. So think about it at the beginning. And now um, we are open for questions for either Mark and or me. Hey, uh, Lori and Mark, both uh, great, great sessions here. So um, I, I've got one question. Uh, we've got several questions, but one is on the non-compete. So as you said, people can work in different places now. So if I work for a company that is based in California, is the, are the non-compete laws um, based on California law or on Illinois law? Well, it, it, interesting that you brought up California, which most people know is the best place for an employee to be. That they are the most employee friendly state and non-competes are illegal in California. There are a handful of states that have that law that is being proposed federally. They're illegal. So if a California employer is trying to enforce a non-compete in California, they're going to have a hard time. Um, but there, there are California employers that have Illinois employees or Delaware employees. And so they can have contracts based on, it should be based on the law where the employment occurs, where the employee is working. Sometimes contracts will have uh, the governing law as the headquarters of the company or um, where the company has been incorporated. Um, some courts will follow those, what we call choice of law provisions and other courts won't. They will look beyond that to what's the reality? Where was this employee? What are the ties to the employee? And if that state law is more favorable to the employee, they will generally enforce that law. Okay, thank you. Uh, sure. For Mark, um, what are some of the ways to make employees problem solvers? You mentioned make them problem solvers in your presentation. How do you go about doing that? Yeah, um, and before I answer, I'm going to answer the next slide uh, so that people have an opportunity to take advantage of our offer some free resources, and I'll answer your question. 
Uh, if you are so into doing QR codes, Lori and I have put together some documents that can uh, be additional resources for you to use based upon our presentation. There's a checklist in there of uh, winning ways to engage employees a values, mission, and vision blueprint that you can use to create those from scratch or to validate and check against your current set of those, and then legal workplace and culture and compliance checklist. So I'm going to leave this up while I answer your question. So ways to uh, uh, turn employees into problem solvers, a couple of three things to keep in mind. Again, it comes back to mindset. Encourage employees to think about uh, things in a couple of different ways. Number one, to understand that opportunities always exist amidst difficulty. Quite often people who are very task oriented will see a problem and they'll see it as a barrier and they are so focused on the task or the flow of the work that they, they, they can't think outside the box. So encouraging people to first think about there's always an opportunity there, even in the worst of difficulties is a way to get that problem solving, those problem solving juices started. Secondly, to encourage people to think about things differently. One of my favorite quotes from Albert Einstein, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we use when we, when, we, when we created them. And that's certainly true in business as well. So um, thinking about things differently is the start of how you get people to be problem solvers. Second, tap into individual employees, individual talents and strengths. Quite often, we forget the fact that each individual may have a, a nuance or a capability that um, until a problem arises, it's hidden. So encouraging people to tap into their individual talents or strengths or their now individual knowledge about the business because of what they're doing or who they're in touch with is a great way to unfold and get people to, into that problem solving mode. And then thirdly, as a leader or a manager, avoid taking on the problem solving on your own. Give the work back to the employees to do. It's very common and it's part of culture in a lot of organizations that when people, when employees have an issue, where do they go? They go to their boss and say, boss, I got a problem. And the expectation is the boss is going to solve it. And in most cases, the boss has the, the, the mindset that, hey, I'm the boss, I got to solve this problem. That's actually not the right thing to do. To turn people into problem solvers, you give the work back to them to do. Now you support them and you provide support and guidance. But at the end of the day, put the onus, not the onus, but the expectation on them to solve the problem. And if you support them, you're going to, you're going to tap into all those benefits I talked about earlier. That's like being a good parent. Let, yeah, the, I kind let of your is. child do it for yeah. themselves. Don't do it for them. Yep, exactly. That's right. So um, got another question for you, Lori here. Um, what are the limits, if any, in classifying a trade secret for quote confidential, I guess, confidential information info as a non-compete? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. I mean, you can have you can have an agreement, an NDA confidentiality agreement that's called that, but might have non-compete provisions in there, and so it's more than an, an NDA agreement. Um, I mean, trade secrets, you know, are based, are statutory. Trade secret is something like you know the the, the recipe or you know specific. Um, operational procedures, something like that, a customer list, those are trade secrets. But even information that's not classified as a trade secret could still be pro proprietary and confidential and should not be used or disclosed, you know, other than in the work environment. Um, I'm, I'm just not sure I understand the question you in know, terms of I, I, classifying yeah, it I as think, a non-compete. Um, well, there, there are two separate things, really. There's a, there could be a, a confidentiality agreement where the employees agree not to reveal confidential information, and then there can be a non-compete. And so the non-compete may be, you know, they, they may have both of those uh, types of agreements. Right, as right. Opposed or you can have an agreement all with all. One. Yeah, yeah, okay. So um, I think you may have answered this it says if a company is paying a total salary of 60 to 70 K, including commission, but they're reporting the commission as reimbursement and reporting the base salary as lower pay is the employee is still tied to the non-compete. So the, the requirement of the $75,000 is annual expected earnings, and that's any type of W-2 earnings. It can include um, 
It can include commissions. Uh, it can okay. include salary bonus. So yeah. as long as their expected earnings are at that point, um, it doesn't really matter what you're reporting. I'm not sure where, what, but it's not just based on base salary. Yeah. Okay. That's that's the key. I think is that it's total total expected or total actual earnings that would be reported on W two. Um, Let's see, the, um, we've got time for one more question here. I think there was one. Oh, um, do you have any play, uh, ideas on where to find an employee handbook template? Um, well, you can find those online. If you want to find a good one, then I would talk to an employment lawyer <laughs> or at least start with an HR consultant and then have an employment lawyer review and make sure that it's compliant because... They're very customized. They're based often on the size of the company, where it's where the employees are located. Sometimes they may be in more than one state, and so you have to have addendums. Um, so uh, you know, I I would not recommend using one that you get online. Yeah, one size does not fit all. You know, Lori, that's the, the yeah, that's the same advice that at Score we provide our clients when they ask for the templates. You can get a template and get some ideas from it, but you really do. If you want one that's enforceable and want one that is um, a, a good um, policy, uh, then you need to engage an attorney on that. So, okay. Mark, you want to go to the last slides here? Yeah, and, just real quickly um, uh, to Lori's point, um, yeah. we're offering a complimentary assessment or audit uh, for your business. It's no charge. It's free of, free of obligation. Uh, I am happy to do an engagement and culture assessment where we'll do a quick look under the hood. Jenna will do it with a Zoom, Zoom call, spend about an hour, and I'll give you some recommendations uh, uh, pro bono. And Laurie will do an employee compliance, compliance audit. Here is our contact information, uh, which is also in the chat if you're not into the QR code stuff that I just showed you. So you can also go there and send us a message, and we'll send you the free resources. So with that, uh, just a quick reminder. Uh, We'll be back next week at the same time, 6.30, uh, to do the second session. We're going to focus on creating an inclusive culture for employee retention. So we're going to focus more on culture and some things related to that. Lori will continue on the legal technical aspects. Here is a, uh, a QR code to register for that session. And there's also the, uh, the uh, link itself. And so with that, John, I'll go to your final slides. And by the way, I want to add my thank you to Lori's to SCORE and to you, John, for allowing us to speak to your group tonight. We hope uh, everybody got at least one takeaway. Yes, thank you all. Thank you yeah, for, for your welcome. engagement. Uh, it was a, yeah, it was a great, uh, great presentation. A lot of good information there. So uh, here's some, I'm gonna stop the recording now. The. Um,